Well, good morning and welcome to another teaching. It's a Monday morning here in Texas and uh, hopefully all are just rocking on in Jesus. Merry Christmas. Hopefully, uh, you know, we're just having a Christ filled Christmas season, you know, just spending time meditating on all that Jesus has done and who he is and, and just the, uh, just the overwhelming, incredible, um, unspeakable blessing that our savior has been born. Um, and just, uh, and just keeping that at the forefront of our mind for most of us, again, Christmas is just a fun time to celebrate with family and friends and to go to parties and just, uh, have fellowship and community. But the more it can be about Jesus, the better off it is. Matter of fact, the more anything, is about Jesus. The more we invite Jesus into it, I'm not talking about in a religious way here. I'm not saying by any means that you have to. It's just what we get to do when Jesus is a part of something, even our Christmas celebrations, which are again, a celebration of his birth. Uh, whenever Jesus is a part of something, it's just going to be better. It's just going to be, uh, it's going to have more, just more love, more power, more meaning, right, Esther? So thank you, Lord Jesus. Today, we're going we're gonna to do the first part of a, of a two-part teaching in Luke chapter 1, which is the story of the, the, the shepherds going to see Jesus at the manger. Oftentimes, in, when we have all the manger scenes, you know, they're not, uh, they're not biblically accurate, meaning sometimes we'll see the three wise men at the manger where the wise men were not at the manger. The wise men came to the, the house of Mary and Joseph when Jesus is around two years old. But the only people to see Jesus on the day of his birth, the Bible records, are Mary and Joseph and the shepherds. And we're going to talk about what it means to, to have a shepherd's heart. And do you have a, a shepherd's heart today? So... We'll probably go through around verse nine today, and then we will uh, we'll finish it up next time, Lord willing. So, Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank you for your mercy and favor and goodness on our lives. We thank you for your love, Father. We just thank you for this Christmas season. We thank you for your word, but above all, we thank you for Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and Master and King. Lord Jesus, we worship you and we thank you today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this this uh, just the season of the Advent, Lord, of just uh, the coming and the anticipation of the Savior, Lord, as we come up to Christmas. We just thank you for that, Lord Jesus. We thank you for just uh, willingly becoming a, a human man for us and for living a perfect life for us and for dying a perfect death for us. And we thank you that you are alive and risen today and Lord Jesus, we worship you. Holy Spirit, we ask you to lead us and guide us now as we open the word of God, your word. We ask that you would give us eyes that see you and ears that hear you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, Luke chapter two, we're gonna start reading in verse one. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Verse 8, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. 
Verse 10, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So I don't know how far we'll get today. Um, again, maybe through verse 9 or 10, I'm not sure. But just a, just an incredible teaching. Remember, we, we always want to know when we come to the scriptures, when you read this, you want to read it carefully. You want to study it. You want to pick it apart. And the first thing you want to understand is that the purpose, it's, it's not in here to give you a history lesson. Okay? It certainly is a history lesson. These are things that happened. It's, it's not in here to inform you of what happened, although it certainly does that, but that's not its primary purpose. Romans 15, 4 says that everything that was written in the past, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us or instruct us. And it goes on to say, so that by the encouragement of the scriptures, right, we, we might have hope. So when you read this, it's not just in here for information, for you to read a cool story about what happened, you know, in the life of Mary and Joseph and Jesus. You want to see what does it have in here to teach you and instruct you, to teach me and instruct me. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful, useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, training in righteousness so that the man of God may be fully equipped for every good work. So again, all scripture is useful, not just as information, right? It's not to be a history book like we study U.S. history. Again, we do learn history. We do get the information, but it's it's far more than that. All scripture, not all history, but all the Bible is, comes from the breath of God. It has the spirit of God, right? It is inspired by the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit himself, and is useful, right, for teaching. So what does this have to teach us? Correcting. What does this have? When we look inside this, what can we learn with regard to correction in our own lives? Rebuking. See, when we don't listen to correction, we need to get rebuked by the Bible. And training in righteousness, training in living a lifestyle of doing what's right. And in as much, we get better equipped to live out the life that our Heavenly Father has, has given us and set forth for us. So again, that's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and Romans 15, 4. Um, you know, it, it, we've gotten to a place in the body of Christ where often we teach this as a lesson, as if that's the only reason it's in here. We teach a lesson on history and it's not, okay? That's, that's the smallest reason it's in here. And if that's all you do with it, it's no, you know, it's not a whole lot different than reading a history book. Still better, but not a whole lot different because it is the word of God. So we want to find in here what's to teach us, instruct us, correct us, <laughs> rebuke us, and train us to do what's right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Verse one. Golly, this stuff is good. It's just not, uh, I mean, this is just, this is just rock and paying, right? In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Verse 2, this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. First census to take place while Quirinius, Quirinius is governor of Syria. I mean, why does the Lord, I mean, 
I mean, could there be a worse time? Stephen, could there be a worse time for a census to be taken? I mean, seriously, right? Um, Mary and Joseph are about to have a baby. They're about, uh, you know, they're a couple of days from Jesus being born. The God man is about to be born. Right, Scott? So, you know, Mary now, I, I think how it works, I, I had taught this before and others had told me that right before you give birth to the baby, you're at your biggest, right? Like you're you're at your biggest, you're at your most uncomfortable and it's, it's hard, right, Melanie? Um, you know, just all the guys in our ministry are, uh, are married, their wives have uh, children, they have children and it's uh it's my understanding that that the woman continues to get bigger and at the time of the birth or the couple of days before she's at her biggest and most uncomfortable so imagine being joseph and particularly mary and you're just waiting for this to happen you're ready to have the baby you know born and all of a sudden you know, the crier comes into town, the messenger comes in and says, you know, uh, Caesar Augustus has decreed a census has to be taken. Everybody has to go to your your uh, your own town to register wherever you you came from. Um, so wherever you came from, verse three. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. Now, apparently he needed to take his wife with him um, because, you know, the baby could be born at any time. I mean, uh, just what is that like, right? We're not told how long this to say it was a day or two journey, right? And Mary's on a donkey, right? Have, 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 have any of y'all, ladies, have you ever had to ride a donkey for a day or two, two days before, you had your baby. Can't be pleasant, right? And 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 just why does the Lord <laughs> I just I'm serious. Why does the Lord seemingly allow certain trials in our lives, certain inconveniences in our lives at the most inopportune time? Now, this had to be done for a prophecy to be fulfilled, but this, again, cannot be altogether pleasant for Joseph, and particularly Mary. As a matter of fact, it's altogether unpleasant, right? We have close friends from church, Veronica and Chris, who are going to give birth to their firstborn. Bless them, Lord Jesus. Um, my man, Frederick. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And, uh, you know, I, I think the baby is, is set to be born on the 9th. Of, so thank you, Lord. Um, this will post later. But uh, but it's, can you imagine, Veronica, going on that donkey right now, today? Be around today for you. Chris, loading you up on that donkey saying, come on, sweetheart, let's get up on here. And then Chris taking the donkey's reins and, you know, having you walk to, uh, you know, Oklahoma or something, right? I, the principle here is that I mean, it's it's like a, it's it's like it's like a you have got to be kidding me moment, and the Lord in His grace, or in His humor, certainly in His blessing, because there's a blessing on the other side of it, as we always know. It, he just allows these events, <laughs> and I just you know, it just yeah. So, thank you, Lord Jesus. I mean, Joseph and Mary already have had a fairly difficult time. With all that's happening, Joseph was going to divorce her, if you recall, early on, um, because he didn't believe her, that the baby in her was from the Holy Spirit, 
And that would be hard for any man to believe, right? But, and here it is, that census has to hit. I mean, why can't the crier come in a week later, two weeks later? But no, it's got to be right now. And everyone went to his hometown to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Verse 5, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And naturally, verse 6, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Verse 7, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. No room in the inn. Hmm. So you have to go. You have to load up your, 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 your pregnant wife. And go on this journey. No way she can walk, right? So undoubtedly she's on a, just again, what's it like to be two, three days from giving birth to your baby and to just be, be saddling on that donkey? It's got to be uncomfortable. It looks horribly uncomfortable when a lady can be in the most comfortable position possible. So imagine you were married. So I want to say again, you know, Having a baby is not an easy thing, right? And I'm thankful to, to all that, that, that ladies do in giving birth. I can't even imagine it. It seems like as men, we got it easy, frankly. Um, but, uh, you know, can you imagine something more difficult? You know, just imagine, ladies, just somebody coming to you. Two, three days before your baby's to be born, you're eight and a half months, whatever it is, pregnant, nine months pregnant and telling you, we, we got to take a journey. Um, you wouldn't even want to go in the car. No, no, we got a journey on a donkey. Don't worry, I'm going to let you have the donkey. I'm not going to have you pull the donkey, Mary. I I'll go ahead, though. I'll pull the donkey and I'll, I'll walk on the ground and I'll let you ride on the donkey. <laughs> that was that was uh, very gracious of Joseph, I'm sure. Um, again, it doesn't say this, but again, we can't expect that Mary two days from being pregnant is going to probably have to walk. So undoubtedly, they're going to they're going to be on an animal. Right. Or she would be um, supposedly. And so, again, just the whole thing is altogether inconvenient. So some of the greatest blessings of the Lord we see can come after what seemingly are the greatest, frustrating, most inconvenient difficulties or trials. Now, now see that, you know, um, oftentimes, again, in my life, I know that I, I, I do this a lot, you know, and forgive me, Father, because I complain a lot that, that, that like, are you serious, right? And whatever it was, you got pulled over by a policeman, you got in, a, you got in an accident, right, Kristen? Um, you know, just whatever it is, Corinne. Right. It's just the are you kidding me moments. But these are times that 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 the Lord, again, brings into our lives, allows into our lives, either causes it or allows it. And there's not a much difference. Right. Um, either way, as Jerry Bridges said, it has at least this passive approval because he could have stopped it. Um, but but on the other side of that, what may come out of that. Is a blessing that we'll never understand. And so the Lord, the Lord allows this or orders this or moves on Caesar to have this taken so that Joseph has to go up. Um, and again, this does fulfill prophecy. Um, it says he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Um, according to, to Matthew 1, um, you know, they were married, but they had not been intimate yet um, while she was pregnant with Jesus. Mary did go on to have other children with Joseph. Verse six, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. I mean, again, it's, uh, we are creatures stuck in time and to us, time is everything. I, I love to choose the timing of things, but normally the timing chooses us and the Lord is, 
is always behind the timing. Again, either causing it or allowing it. Right, Esther? Um, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She gave birth to Jesus. But look at this in verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Not only does the Lord drive them on this altogether inconvenient, frustrating, unpleasant journey with a, a lady who's, who's uh, a young woman, probably 15 or 16 right now at this point of the pregnancy, could have been 14 when she got pregnant. But again, she could be anywhere 15, 16, right around that age. So she's a young woman, um, incredible woman of God. Um, and, and, and I have little doubt Mary and Joseph complain less, less than I do. You know, we are a, uh, we are a complaining church. We really are, Father, and I, I'm sorry. I know I'm as big a problem as anyone, Lord, and I ask you to forgive us and cleanse us of this, Lord, and uh, just help us, Lord, to live our lives with an eye to Jesus. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us to live our eyes, our lives focused on Jesus. There's no room for him in the end. As if it's not enough, undoubtedly Joseph is going around in the inn Whatever happened, Mary's water broke, whatever, whatever clued it in that the baby was to be born, that's probably what happened, right? And, uh, you know, they're looking for a, a place, and Joe's saying, I got to have a room, and there are no rooms. The innkeeper says there are no rooms, so Joseph probably goes to different people and says, man, my, my wife is having a baby. Can we, can, can we use your room? Nope. No. Nobody wants to give up their room. I don't think they had Jesus in a manger with animals out of choice. Undoubtedly, Joseph would have tried to secure a room for his wife like any of us was, right? We would have gone to every room and say, come on, man, let me have the room. My wife is about to have a baby, right? Now, again, it doesn't tell us this here. But when we're studying it, we can use, you know, be sensible and to see it's, you know, there was no room in the end, right? Wouldn't you try to get a room for your wife? So again, this is, this is a, a, again, another inconvenience, another trial that Jesus undoubtedly, you know, God the Son, Jesus, just determined that he would be born in a manger. But let me ask you today. Do you not think today, right now, in 20, the end of 2021, don't you think 2,000 years ago that all those people wished that they had given up their room in the end for Jesus? No one was willing to help them. No one was willing to give up their room for Mary to have the baby. No one was willing to make a sacrifice, a comparatively very small sacrifice. You know, say for me, in my present state, or the vast majority of us, Scott, I mean, sure, go ahead and, yeah, man, I get it. Go ahead, no, use the room. I mean, go ahead, that, that's fine, I'll, I'll do something. You know, we often miss opportunities to be a blessing and we will never know what we missed when we don't do it. The Lord will put opportunities in our lives. There were opportunities for people to be a blessing to Mary, Joseph, and especially Jesus. Imagine if someone had given up their room. Do you believe that the Lord Jesus would have blessed them? Yeah. Yeah. But no one did. And, uh, you know, where is your heart today? Where is my heart? Do we have a heart to be a blessing to those in need, to those less fortunate? 
to those who are in a more difficult spot than us? Do we even think about it, Anthony? Do we even consider it? She gave birth to her firstborn a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Father, I do ask you to, to give us eyes that see and ears that hear and hearts that are convicted, Lord, to serve you and your kingdom and your people with greater love, with greater mercy, with greater compassion in Jesus' name. Hmm. So again, we see again these principles of the Lord allowing them to go through difficulties, trials, hardships, inconveniences. But out of that and in the place of that, the Lord Jesus is born. The greatest blessing to enter the history of the world, the greatest blessing in all eternity, enters into our world. God the Son, Jesus, comes into the world but consistently through trials and difficulties and inconsistent and, uh, just inconveniences, frustrations, and hardships. So again, when the Lord brings hardships and difficulties and you're in my life, May, we certainly need to do a better job, my wife May, I do, I mean, in, particularly in leading us, and, and how we handle it and how we manage it and seeing what the blessing is that the Lord has on the other side of it. And as a Christian today, if our faith can grow that if you're in a trial, just to know, the scriptures make it clear that, that if you're in a trial or difficulty, it's a blessed time because blessing and growth and, and, and a refining of your faith is going gonna, is gonna to come on the other side of it. We see it in James 1. Um, we see it in, uh, in 1 Peter 1. Just these, these principles that, that our faith is being refined and that it's pure as gold. James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials or difficulties of many kind because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that we could be mature and complete. Um, which, which maybe a handful of us are in the world today. Um, so we just have a lot of growth, Right. Uh, certainly I do. You know, uh, James says, you know, consider it joy again when you have trials and difficulties of many kinds because the testing of your faith and your faith is not tested in good times. Right, Chris? But, you know, it comes at the testing of your faith produces perseverance and perseverance character. Right. Uh, Romans um, chapter five, verses one. Um, um but James says this happens so that we could grow to be mature and complete someplace I'm clearly not, but I want to be, right? And so you can see that Christian maturity in Christ and completeness doesn't come without trials and difficulties. And again, we certainly see it's no different here. And the blessing that comes out of that is nothing short of the greatest blessing in the history of the world that has ever been or ever be. Jesus Christ has now entered the world. Wow. Wow. Verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Do you have the heart of a shepherd? That's what we're titling this. Do you have the heart of a shepherd? Because again, the only people to see Jesus at his birth that we're told in the scriptures is Mary his mother, Joseph, his stepfather, stepfather because the Holy Spirit is Jesus' father because the Holy Spirit made Mary pregnant, and the shepherds, only people to see Jesus. The greatest blessing in the history of the world. Why did our Heavenly Father choose these men to appear to? Because they were shepherds and they had the heart of a shepherd. Do you have the heart of a shepherd today? Would the Lord have chosen you? The shepherds are the lowest of society. You notice none of the, the big pastors or elders or teachers or Pharisees or Sadducees or scribes, certainly none of the governmental officials, Herod, none of them got to see Jesus. None of them had a heart to see Jesus. None of them cared enough to see Jesus 
But these shepherds had pliable hearts. Shepherds are not interested in status or notoriety. They are uh, they're simple men who have hearts able to receive revelation from the Lord. So is that you or I today? I was praying with my brother today, Jesse, just, uh, and we were just talking about, and I was praying just that we would, we would have hearts that were not so consumed with the things of this world or people of this world, you know, whether it be our own families or our hobbies, our games, our finances, whatever it is. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Terrified. That's what happens when an angel of the Lord shows up, and the glory of the Lord comes with that holy angel. terrified. They, they thought they could die at any moment, right? Terror had struck them. You know, sometimes we, we want a visitation from the Lord and we don't know what we're asking for. You remember in Revelation chapter one, when, when the apostle John, as a very old man now, saw Jesus and he said, I fell at his feet as though dead. That's how scared he was. Just, just fell down and collapsed as though dead. Could have fainted. I fell at his feet as though dead. Just fell down in terror. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Verse 10, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. It's always the first thing generally you'll hear an angel say. Same thing Jesus says to John in Revelation, don't be afraid. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Verse 11, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. We're going to finish here. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all people. Not just the Jewish people. Not just the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles. But for all people. And the reason it's all people is because all people need Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. The Bible is unambiguous that all human beings, every single one alive, whatever it is, 8 billion people in the world, all of them, Linz, need a Savior. Every single one, Papa, needs a Savior. The reason we need a Savior is every single one of us is sinful. The Bible is unambiguous that all human beings are sinful. Romans 3.23 says, all of us have sinned and fall short of God's holy standard. Because of our sinfulness, we are all spiritually dead if we're not in Christ Jesus. We have no spiritual life in us. We have natural life, but we are dead to God. We, we, we have no experience with spiritual reality whatsoever. We are spiritually dead in our sin, and our only hope is a Savior. Verse 11, and that Savior is Christ the Lord. Have you today trusted in Jesus Christ? as your only Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of your sins, the salvation of your soul, and for spiritual life to come inside you and to come to you, that you might receive spiritual life in and through Jesus Christ. Are you currently, actively today, David, relying on Jesus Christ and him alone 
for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul. Have you today come before Jesus humbly, acknowledging your hopelessness, your helplessness, and your desperation for him, confessing to him that you have no other hope but him alone to save you from your sin and to bring you to heaven when you die. Romans 10, 13 says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's not the words that save us. It's Christ that saves us. But have you come to him and received him and called out to him, humbly acknowledging your sinfulness and your desperate need of him to save you? John 1, 12 says that to all who received him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It's only in Jesus Christ, only in Jesus Christ that God the Father is your heavenly Father. Only in Jesus Christ can your sins be forgiven. Only in Jesus Christ does the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, come inside you and give you spiritual life only in Jesus Christ. Only in Jesus Christ do you have relationship with the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three separate beings. Only in Jesus do you have intimate relationship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And it's only in Jesus Christ that you can go to heaven when you die. Without Jesus, you have none of those things, and regrettably, only eternal hell separated from the triune God awaits. Give your life to Jesus today. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. With that heart, with that understanding of what I just said, go before Jesus and humble yourself in reverence, in fear, pleading for his mercy and call out to him, Lord Jesus, I confess I am a sinful person. I confess I cannot save myself. Lord Jesus, I'm hopeless. I'm desperate. I'm helpless. But I believe you are the son of God. I believe you did come into this world for me. I believe you lived a perfect life for me and died a torturous death on the cross for me. And Lord Jesus, I believe you are alive and risen today. And Lord Jesus, I ask you now to come into my heart, to be the Lord of my life, to save me from my sin and to bring me to heaven when I die. Lord Jesus, I place all my faith and trust and confidence and reliance on you alone to save me and to be my everlasting Lord and God. That's how you become a Christian. You can use the words I use, but it's the heart that matters. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. Jesus is our Savior. And then after you've received Jesus, if you're a Christian today, then you spend your life as a disciple of Jesus Christ, growing to know him better, growing to love him more, growing in relationship with your Father, with Jesus the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. And you know, this is good news of great joy. The gospel and the birth of Jesus has become kind of commonplace to most, really all of us. Meaning, when you hear the story about Jesus and Christmas, do you just explode in great joy? No, most of us don't. And Father, I ask you to forgive us for that. Because it is good news of great joy. Do not be afraid, verse 10, I bring you good news of great joy. That's for all people. We need to get, get to a place where we begin to have joy. It's great joy of really what it means that Jesus has entered the world. This Christmas season, let's just start thinking more and more and more and more about just, just the incredible magnitude and all that it means that the Savior has been born and he is Christ the Lord. 
Well, Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your goodness, Father. But more than anything, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for giving us Jesus, our only Lord and Savior and Master and King. Lord Jesus, we worship you today. We thank you and we praise you just for all you've done in becoming a human man for us, dying a torturous death for us. And we thank you that you are alive and risen in our King, our Savior, our God. Holy Spirit, we ask you to, to lead us to Jesus today. Lead us anew and afresh. Lord, to the feet of Jesus, to the manger of Jesus, Lord. Holy Spirit, just lead us wherever we need to go that we might experience Jesus Christ in a more profound and intimate way. Father, we love you and we bless you. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.